in a few minutes now. But first, Kenya's quest to become food secure will remain a mirage unless urgent, deliberate incentives and policy interventions that effectively respond to impediments in the sectors impacting food and nutritional security are taken care of. This is according to a report by the Route to Food Initiative that highlighted shortcomings of the recently tabled 2018-2019 budget to the agricultural sector. Take a look. According to the report, which comprehensively analyzed the 2018-2019 budget from a right of food perspective, allocations to the food and nutrition security was a paltry 3.54% of the national government expenditure despite this sector being one of the pillars under the government big four priority development agenda. We have a massive figure of 1.9 billion that we need to divvy up. We need to actually allocate that cake. So that's a very big cake. And to our surprise, to our surprise, very little of this cake actually goes towards that fundamental right I mentioned before, which is the right to food. According to Alex Owino, the author of the report, the budget lack explicit policies, programs and comprehensive physical initiatives to address constitutionally guaranteed human rights to food. Very little. If you look at livestock, basically six billion shillings as petty cash. If you look at crop development, 25 billion, that is smaller than even NYS. I think they're getting 25 billion to waste around. If you look at uh, fisheries, aquaculture, and the blue economy, that is nothing to write home about, about 3 billion shillings. The report also falls the budget statement for its various contradicting proposals, which if implemented will disproportionately negatively affect small-scale farmers. Two such proposals include the removal of interest rate caps and classification of fuel and oil as VAT exempt, which in turn raises financial costs for the sector despite government pledge to make affordable credits available. The other problem that we've created is this institutional mess around agriculture. You devolve it, but you keep the money in the treasury. You keep yeah. the money behind, but you're saying, I'm giving you this, but you, you just play around with it and, and come back, let's talk. Given that agriculture is a devolved function, the report advocates for allocation of up to 50% of the 6.24 billion shillings conditional cash transfers to county governments to be specifically spent on food and nutrition security programs. If I were to spend Rotich 39 billion, I would put 75% of that budget in the hands of farmers. At the same time, the Route to Food initiative called for the adoption and dissemination of the implementation framework for the Food and Nutrition Security Policy, which was released this year by the Ministry of Agriculture. Philip Keitan, KTN News. Well, of course, on the back of that story right there, the fact that uh, farmers here continue to struggle with working literally from how to get from the farm to the market, part of it is a question of connectivity and exactly what they need to do to be able to get to learn about what exactly is happening in the market. Well, there are some organizations out there that have been trying to address this connectivity challenge. One of them is the Kraft Silicon Foundation. Well, part of a company that well, is a 365 degree company in the IT space. Now, what exactly they have been doing is that they have gone out there with solar powered buses, which then go out and find disadvantaged people, disadvantaged youth, and others who are then given some sort of training that enables them to be able to start to well, play their part in the economy. And of course, this is also greatly, uh, greatly driven by the fact that a lot of government service is now online. Well, to speak into that conversation, Priya Budabati, CEO and founder of the Kraft Silicon Foundation, is with us. Karibu Sana. Thank you so much. Now, first off, the fact that, as I just indicated, a huge, huge chunk of uh, government service is now done through platforms such as, well, it's literally online, the Huduma Centers. Uh, people just finished filing their tax returns. The deadline was over the weekend, again, online. For anyone who literally has no access or is unable to use their IT space because of, well, illiteracy, so to say, this is a huge, huge disadvantage. Right. What does this mean? I think um, the Craft Silicon Foundation has played a big role in this sector yes. by providing free ICT education to the less privileged people in the country. Yes. With um, a lot of e-government services coming in place now, and our beneficiaries have really appreciated with this knowledge, and it 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 helped them quite in a big way. Yes. What, what do you think this then means for a person who 
uh, so to say, is at a place where they have zero to no access, and then suddenly, uh, over the space of maybe three or four, five, six months, they are able to start uh, doing these things online. What does this mean for a person? Well, it hasn't been very easy. That's the, one of the challenges that we personally experienced during our community work, mm -hmm. because most of these less privileged people have never seen what computer even looks like. And that's where we need to come in force and bridge the digital divide. I think government and like-minded people and private sectors need to play a role in this. Uh, Kenya and Africa at large is very slow and low still in this sector. Um, the government is doing its best, but we still need to put more efforts in this. Mm -hmm. It takes a while before we con uh, do a lot of counseling to them and uh, make them understand what IT is and the importance of IT is before they can actually get into the program. What you're saying essentially points to a gap where um, the government is trying to address it through the early schooling programs. Yes. But for people who are not in the formal uh, schooling system, mm. this then remains a challenge. And you are trying to fill that space. Yes, it's, it's, that's very big. Uh, it's a big challenge, especially for the women. I'm more passionate about women, in particular the girl child, uh, speaking to them, counseling them, that this has become a lifestyle. There's no way we can get away with the digital world. Um, before they get into the program, we have a lot of uh, challenges of the dropouts. Yes. Uh, that's why it, it's quite disappointing, but we have to keep them into this. Um, the fact that uh, so many people now have mobile phones should go some way to start to make life for you easier, especially because with things like Mpesa, they are literally pushed by the circumstances to start to try to understand what interacting with the online space then means. Do you think this is helping? It definitely is, yes. Be when, when you have uh, situations where you want people to uh, be able to come in and start to generate their own interest. Do you find that uh, then uh, people working on mobile phone vis-a-vis -vis having to work on a platform like, uh, well, a desktop computer makes it easy? Uh, I think every, everything has become on the mobile. You can check your emails, you can do all your services on a mobile. We have smartphones now. Um, so I think um, gone are the days where we have a desktop. Technology is on the go. So if you have a smartphone and you have it all, uh, if, if, if you think about the fact that there are so many, many Africans out there who have yet to even begin to interact with the things that we are talking about, what sort of challenge do you think this is? And uh, do you think you are up to this challenge, organizations such as yourselves? Yes, we are definitely uh, up to this challenge. Mm -hmm. It's not very easy, but uh, the vision is strong. Mm -hmm. um, we have the youth we need to, uh, who are so much diverted into the mobile phones, mm -hmm. and we need to divert them to do something more positive, yes. because we have this youth who are playing games all the time, mm -hmm. social media has become, it can be good or bad. Mm -hmm. Even but pornography. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cyber crime as well, so yes. we need to take advantage of this youth from the negative to the positive. Mm -hmm. Let, let's then talk about the fact that uh, the Foundation has uh, just recently spread its wings to Uganda. Right. And the fact that uh, that is uh, just uh, two out of 54 African countries. And yes. uh, Kenya tends to be at the forefront of uh, this, uh, so to say, IT development. Right. The situation is much, much worse in other places. What do you think has to be done inclusively by different stakeholders in order to start to spread this gospel even further? Well, um I think our program has gone really far just with one mobile ICT bus. It's a very unique concept. Mm -hmm. It goes to your doorstep. Mm -hmm. uh, probably I wouldn't have uh, been able to um, educate 9,400 students in seven years mm -hmm. if it was just a classroom, a lab. Yes. Because it's a mobile ICT lab, it goes to your doorstep. Mm -hmm. I was able to target more people in the country with one mobile ICT bus. With a lot of demand after seeing the success of our project here, yes. we are spreading our wings first in Uganda and other parts of Africa. So then what does the future then hold? Uh, because with the increased demand going across borders, do you see an expansion? We've seen places where this has even started to be institutionalized uh, with government. Uh, there are larger global players like Intel and uh, even others like Google who might be looking for local uh, supporters who then understand the local operating environment to be able to drive this forward? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. We can't do this alone. Yes. We need like-minded people, government support to spread our wings mm -hmm. in Africa. Yes. So finally, the fact that uh, this is just a uh, craft silicon doing this, uh, of course, uh, you have a large stakeholder ecosystem. 
Uh, what would be your call to the people out there who are watching you and feel that they would need to be able to contribute in one way or another to an initiative like this and enable them to take this drive forward? Uh, as I mentioned, we need a lot of support. Yes. We've gone quite far. We've educated a lot of students, 9,400 uh, mm -hmm. students. We've created job opportunities with yes. our company itself, Craft Silicon, mm -hmm. and Little Cabs, who yes. are taking a lot of the students on board. Mm -hmm. uh, we've assisted them in job opportunities, creating small businesses as well. Mm -hmm. But we still need more people to partner with us. Mm -hmm. We need to get to all the counties. Yes, in terms of uh, geographical spread, is what I was going to ask. What countries are, uh, counties are you in currently? and uh, which ones are you planning for in the near future? Uh, at present, it's just Nairobi with mm -hmm. five slums that we have targeted, Kibera, mm -hmm. Madari, Huruma, mm -hmm. Maruku, and uh, Kangemi. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, with more buses, we'll be able to hit, get to all the counties as well. Mm -hmm. And now that we have spread our wings to Uganda, definitely with more support, we will be able to get, get on all part of the Africa. OK, indeed, uh, Priya Budabati, thank you very much. See you at uh, Craft Silicon Foundation. Asante sana for your time. Thank you so much. OK, indeed, uh, on that again, she and the organization have been taking this, well, IT education out there to the masses, educating them about ICT, and so far 9,400 students educated already and spreading their wings to Uganda. On that note, we go to a short commercial break. When we come back, conversation that we have been talking about around counterfeits and what it means for the motor industry sector. Still ahead, stay with us here on KTN News.